Welcome everybody, the Christian Marauder here. I'm so glad you all showed up tonight. I just got to tell you, we got a really, really great show tonight. And, and again, strap on your seat belts for a fine show and fine time to go in places you never thought you would go before. Well, while folks are joining in right now, let me just ask you, if you haven't joined the Daily Renegade, I'm going to ask, why not? First off, as members, you get access to all the great content all the great unedited shows because with the way social media is right now with all its bans and restrictions on its content you we need new platforms like the daily renegade to carry out a christian message in a hostile world and the daily renegade is a great place to get around all this so if you haven't joined please join today for ten dollars a month or a hundred dollars a year just click on the link below and be a part of the daily renegade with that i'm going to jump right into today's show because we are going to go hot live and heavy right now because we're going to talk about angels demons fallen watchers nephilim the world of the occult witches black magic sorcery warlocks satanism luciferianism is it real is it really real or is this stuff really real folks folks i gotta tell you most of the modern church in the west especially in the United States and Canada and Europe, think the devil is some big pigment of people's imaginations, a man in a red suit and a pitchfork. Demons and fallen angels and Nephilim are all thought as myths, nothing to worry about. That spiritual warfare stuff is not that important because we are more educated, more smarter than the early church ever was. You know, Jesus took care of it all. And that, that stuff that Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 6 about principalities and powers, it doesn't apply today. Well, guess what? The church world suffers from that mindset and the world is going to hell in a handbasket before our very eyes. Despite all the testimonies from people who have come out of Luc Luciferianism, who came out of covens, who come out of witchcraft, who came out of the dark arts, who came out of the New Age movement, who testify how they infiltrate into churches and seminaries and ministries in order to control them or to bring them down. Despite all this and these people becoming Christians and testifying of these things, the modern American church just poo-poos witchcraft and think it's just simply no big deal you know today it's in the news satanism is on the rise people practicing witchcraft are more open about it and they are boasting about it like never before and yet the modern church just thinks it's no big deal well i gotta tell you the origin of luciferianism can be traced right back to ancient Babylonia, Persia, Greece, and the Egyptian gods along with their temple rites. Did you know that? The early church battled these. Those folks knew what it was being conjured up to attack them back then. In fact, Native American Christians also understand the power of witchcraft that's used against them. It's the same as the Christians in Africa do same as in other countries that face this kind of stuff and they learn to deal with it and they become warriors against these things you know like the native americans become warriors against the tall man and slender man a later date and time i'll talk more about that they have to battle the high suicide rates that they suffer and the destruction of the family that they see and the blindness that it all causes people not to even deal with it but the modern urban church laughs at all this stuff and says that it's not real i mean i tell you the state of the church today reflects that it is a mess the enemy is is rising like a flood folks it's rising like a flood with this witchcraft stuff and everything ready to crash into the church and the church is yawning trying to go to sleep and it just laughs it all off well i think it's important to know all this stuff because god said this in exodus 12:12 12, 12, that he was executing judgment on the gods of egypt during the passover night i think that's kind of important right these were not imaginary bogeymen 
our friends, our imaginary friends. These were fallen angels and demons. This battle comes full circle in the book of Revelation when judgment first comes to the house of God, known as the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that we've been talking about. I'm concluding this series with this. You know, this is where the early church battled these patron gods of their cities that were sent against them. The early church knew their own cultural gibbon did did you know that we don't know their cultural gibbons unless we do some simple really simple research and then it just unfolds before your eyes and then the book of revelation starts to make a lot of sense did you know that modern day luciferianism uses the same rites and rituals that were used in the seven cities mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 to invoke their patron deities against the church back then and they are doing so today as well you don't believe me let's see well do you see the effects of gender bending having on the church and and the world and the glorification of moral depravity do you see the destruction of the family are you noticing political agendas to bring down the system have you noticed death threats against opposition of an opposing political party a push for a one world group think in media, movies, books, music, and education, the business world, and governments? Have you noticed this? Have you noticed how Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson and other news media, uh, uh, America News First and other new, and Fox News and, and other outlets are all saying, you know, look, it's happening. People are trying to silence free speech. And Tucker Carlson, like I said last time, had a... Uh, a film clip of a news personality who was saying that anyone who voted for Trump, 60-some million people, should not be able to hold a job, not be able to eat, not be able to to uh, buy or sell. Uh, they Basically, if they don't convert, they need to be exterminated. That's coming from major news sources, folks, from the opposing side. They want to silence. You don't believe that the witchcraft is going on. You think this is just something that's, that's just a logical explanation for it? Well, I got to tell you, this is demonic stuff. This is witchcraft being used. These are the old rites that were, that were used to release what is known in the occult world as a deific mask. Did you know, folks, the modern urbanized church is ignorant of all this stuff and even what a deific mask is, and they are paying a big cost, right? The meaning of the name of each of the seven cities of Revelations chapter 2 and 3 reveal attributes of its patron God. The attributes match what the occult world calls deific mask that are used to conjure up spirits and the basically these are avatars of a deity uh they're like what i call mosquitoes or, or flies to buzz around a person or attack something okay these attributes match what the occult world calls deific mask that are used to conjure up stuff in the occult book and i tell you this is an occult book i don't recommend reading it but i do for research by michael w ford title the sabeti mesopotamian magic and demonology defines what a, a deific mask is and i'm going to paraphrase deific masks are symbols that help identify an attribute of a deity and relate to it on a conscious level by activating these masks which act as avatars for releasing of energy and power of a deity or demon into an area or into a person for service. In other words, a priest or a high priest of, of, of the devil there will, will take on a mask. In other words, think of an avatar as a mask. The mask contains specific attributes of a fallen angel, a.k.a false god false deity to be channeled into an area are used to attack enemies or to get one's goodies from okay again ephesians 6 12 comes to mind about principalities powers 
um, rulers of darkness and hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, right? Well, Michael W. Ford's book puts it like this, and I'm going to paraphrase here. In Luciferianism, gods which are demons are called deific masks, which are basically certain energy or power symbolized as certain attributes of that deity or demon in which a priest or priestess can channel as well as wear the mask themselves in order to control that entity or spirit guide. They, they really think that they can control it. So they think, you know. I got to tell you a living example of one who did. His name is Aleister Crowley. And Aleister Crowley went insane channeling the mask of Lamb who looked like this big gray alien, right? And if you know your stuff, folks, you know what I'm talking about. Well, these people in the occult, they conjure these deific masks, or what I've come to term is releasing their legion units under their name into an area or, or into a person or into a church or ministry. Paul says in Ephesians 6.12, again from the New King James Version, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And, and Mr. Ford's Sobeti, the Mesopotamian Magic and Demonology book, he goes on to say that these masks send forth, and I quote, rebel spirits who might on occasion be in the role of a messenger of the gods. This is an occultist writing this book, folks. I don't recommend it for you. If you're tempted to look at this book, please plead the blood of Jesus over yourself and get strong with Jesus, folks. I got to tell you. Okay? Folks, the stuff is real, and they are doing what is done in those ancient temple ceremonies where a group of conjurers, and you got to think of a coven, unite their will, focus their will, focus intently, all like all nine or twelve of them or thirteen of them, their will, their desires and beliefs, unite it together to call forth and then command and then direct the force of a deific mask to be unleashed to attack the will, desire and belief of a victim or even help someone out to attain some sort of good. Do you get it? It's all about attacking someone's will their desire and their belief or their, what they have faith in to attack it or to help it to achieve some good according to their definition. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 13 mentions this type of witchcraft and the placing of masks on people as the placing of veils. And the placing of veils is precisely what Mr. Ford calls and the occult world known for centuries and centuries and centuries as deific mask. These are the veils that is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 13 verse 18 and it says thus says the Lord God woe to the people who sew magic bands upon all wrist and make veils for the heads of persons of every stature in the hunt for souls. I'm reading out the ESV for you all there and the the idea of magic bands upon their wrist and their sleeves is like put I'm gonna put you in my pocket okay and they make veils to do that they put the ideific mask what I call a bunch of mosquito spirits or a bunch of flies around you to pester you anybody comes near you that will pester them too you ever notice that Have you ever been involved in or been around people like that who have been attacked by witchcraft, they have these thing around them, and they hit you. The people basically are conjuring points, and they don't even know it. And they need to be set free of it by the power of the blood of Jesus, and by the name of Jesus Christ, and by the power and the authority of the Lord. They need to be set free, and they will be by, by the power of the Lord. Okay, These veils are the epic mask that the occultists used, and yes, it's mentioned in the Bible. Hallelujah. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. Folks, it's all about acquiring more and more power to bring people into harmony with their thirst for power so their utopia can finally be had, which consists of overthrowing God's existing order and replace it by ushering in chaos to remake a brave new world of total depravity and misery, a system that will eventually will collapse in on itself because it 
can't stand. Everybody can't live according to do as thou will, because do as thou will will hurt somebody else and justify the hurting in the name of tolerance, right? So let me review the seven churches again and see for yourself. And notice what Jesus says in Revelations chapter 2, 1. And to the messenger of the church of Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Did you know that according to ancient Mesopotamian cosmology, it had seven gods or spirits, they had seven heavens, they had seven evil spirits, and they had seven earths. They have four sets of seven. Let me repeat them. They had seven spirits. These seven spirits are seven sages sent to earth to teach humanity things, to decree their destiny. More on that later. They had seven heavens. They had seven evil spirits to maintain order on earth to the seven sages, spirits, on seven earths. Okay? Well, when I read Revelations chapter 2, 1, it looks like Jesus is taunting the main patron deity of Ephesus, who is said to control the seven spirits, to control the seven earths. Instead of seven sage spirits and seven earths, Jesus is saying that you ain't it. I am sending my seven messengers to my seven churches on earth so your gates of hell will not prevail against it. So back off my church. However, there are those in Ephesus who open the door to let the devil in and they must repent. I'm just paraphrasing what Jesus is trying to say so you can see it. In the book of Revelation, when those first few sentences, you will see Jesus, if you know what you're looking for, taunting these spirits. Isn't that cool? If you don't know what the ancient people did know by just their givens, by living in that time frame, you'll miss it. You'll miss the depth of the reality of the spiritual war that is raging around us, too. And how to defeat it. And how Jesus is, is telling us how through the message to the seven churches, if they would just listen. Well, Diana was the patron god of Ephesus, if you remember and had an altar temple there. The patron god was said to live in the temple to govern an area, according to the ancient cosmology, as their seat of power. The seat of their power was defined by the deific mask, or the attribute of the patron god war. Why? Well, let me try to explain this, because you see in one place there's the temple of Diana there. Then you'll see a temple of Athena in another place. And you'll see a temple of Artemis. And you'll see a temple of Aphrodite. They're all the same being, but each one of those are deific masks of somebody named Ishtar. They're just projecting a certain attribute or a military formation to be unleashed into an area. So the seat of their power was defined by the deific mask of that the patron god wore. Why? To initiate and release by forms of sorcery through libation rites and through blood rituals and all kinds of sex magic, release deific mask, these military formations, into an area to maintain, according to the Luciferianisms, balance of power over an area by using human agents. That's a lot to say. I had to write that down and make sure I get it right, folks. Because you see, what I'm trying to say is this. The ancient temples had altars, and they were usually located in high locations, and they were built, formed out of bricks, rocks, or clay, and they used an ancient Mesopotamian-style altar of an idol or a ritual platform or, or both in which offerings were made. Again, Diana was the patron god of Ephesus, as the book of Acts tells us. Ephesus means, in its definition, what is desirable and permissible. This defines an attribute of a patron god, Diana. and Actually, it defines an ancient patron god, Ishtar, a.k.a. known as Athena, known as Azara, known as Diana. It is its fits the profile of one who teaches what is desirable and permissible in culture, war, love, divination, and commerce. I'm just paraphrasing. Ishtar, a.k.a. Athena, who is Azara, are all the full manifestations 
that wear no mask at all. It's the full force, full brunt force of the deity. Diana is a mask of that deity, the mask, an attribute that's being conjured to attack the opposition. It's a mask of Ishtar releasing certain specific attributes to flip a church, to attack a church, to flip a church, to control a church. Folks, that's what I'm talking about. And in here, they seeking to control the, the church called Ephesus by having them define what is desirable and permissible in the church world. That the Diana mask is the hunter's avatar of Ishtar. What does that mean? It, it, is, uh, it means it's the mask that reflects a use of intelligence and purity in order to be the protector of the common masses. Men fought to the death for the honor of becoming one of her priests. The Diana deific mask puts into people to imagine that their sovereignty, their supremacy trumps all, and they are incapable of feeling pain or remorse. They show complete indifference towards people and their issues. It helps raise up a succession of leaders who wear the same mask, who are really stoic and stern, and their word was the law. Diana also seduces and hunts souls by the use of reason as bait to convert folks to her ways of controlling what is desirable and permissible, and in this case, the church here in Ephesus. The part of the Ephesus church bunch here were seduced to leave their first love, God, through reason. And they were seduced to think they are the only ones who can maintain the purity and intelligence and be the protectors of the common folks in the church. They certainly hunted false brethren, and they hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and they test them, and they find out who they are, and that is in their favor, folks. But some have left their first love for God and become legalistic nitpickers, browbeaters, who come across as the only ones ordained to maintain their supremacy and sovereignty. And they come across folks as incapable of feeling pain or remorse. They're completely indifferent toward others in the church who do not conform to them. Because they have left their first love of God. In other words, the occult world today in the last day's church is conjuring up this type of mask by a cloud of demons to infiltrate and, and pester leaders in this type of church to become that way and the results stain the name of jesus doesn't it you don't want to become a christian because these people in movies stereotype these everybody in the christian church as this type of person when we are not i tell you jesus is telling them if you don't repent of this he's going to remove them from the church put it where you think where it should be go you know you got to remember folks judgment comes first to the house of god Next, Revelations 2.8 talks about the church at Smyrna. And Smyrna means myrrh, as I taught before. I mean, it's the ingredient used for death and burial. It symbolizes that you want to bury, uh, bury something that's dead. You know, folks, I pointed out in part one of the Old God series that Subali or Kybali was the main patron deity of Smyrna and had a temple to Zeus and Aphrodite and Dionysius. These are masks. Sibylle, or, or Kybele, helped to aid Zeus in order to mother the idea of emperor and state worship as the means to silence the church and all who opposed the royal bloodline they were trying to raise up and in order to bring forth the devil's final son, the Antichrist. Go back and listen to that first part one of this series for that information. Dionysius was also known as the dead and rising God, and one of the sons of Zeus, who releases merriment and intoxication into the world to intoxicate the world for the need of the state and a one world leader to arise upon whom we call the Antichrist. And look, listen to what this is saying here. Listen to what Jesus says. Listen to how Jesus taunts the patron gods there. In Revelations 2.8, if you don't believe me. And to the messenger of the church of Smyrna, right? These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. 
Can you hear Jesus implying, wait a minute, you ain't the rising and dead God here. This is my church, and I'll raise them all from the dead. The gates of hell will not prevail here. Folks, can you see Jesus saying that here to those people? That it was he who was dead and come back to life. Not the devil's crowd were sent to bury the church. That's why the church was called the persecuted church. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't. I'll raise my church all from the dead and the gates of hell will not prevail here. Can you see that? The temple of Zeus had occultic rituals to bring forth Satan's plan to maintain his supremacy and a plan to bring forth from the abyss a new leader to rule the world in order to defeat God with the same cosmology, the same storyline of the old gods battling the young gods and the young gods overthrow the old gods by a champion who steps up who shoots an arrow, the arrow being the king who will, because arrows in the Bible happen to refer to people or progeny, so a single arrow, arrow a progeny of Zeus, or, who is Satan, a son of Satan, who, who will bring down God, okay? So the devil can exalt his throne above God's, is what I'm trying to say. And these, all these entities have that plan, and here Jesus is mocking that totally, totally in that. Well, then you also have temples to, to Subali or Kaibali there. Now, and I got to tell you, Kaibali, Ninharsag, and Timiat all share the same profile of being a birth mother of the gods and the lady of the mountains. That's how I connect all of them to, together by their personality profile. And I can find clear cut. They all are ladies of the mountains. They're all birth mother of the gods and monsters and demons. Okay. It's also called, also the one who nurture and trains and equip. This matches Azel's job of corrupting humanity in the making of commer commerce, uh, makeup wearing to change your gender identity, war industry, all manner of depravity and divination. As First Enoch explains, uh, was sentenced. Azel was sentenced to the barren, stony, mountain, rocky valley region of the abyss. Just paraphrasing for you. They all connect. That's why I say they're all the three same beings. So Timiat has a mask called Ninharsag and a mask called Subali or Sibali. Do you get it? And, and even though Timiat, the Leviathan, is still in the, in the abyss, you don't want to stir it up, folks, because it still has power. It brings out these masks and people conjure from it, okay? And Cybele, or Subali, Kybele, Ninharsag, Timia all share the same profile. Don't you get it? it? You know, this is the old crone of the triple goddess worship, whose dark, deific mask is of a dark mother who seeks revenge on any who dare cross her, in this case, the church at Smyrna. She is a he, actually, and paves the way to make chaos in, in the world so, so that folks surrender to the emperor's power of the state as their god in order to toe the party line to get their gets and goodies from God. The book of Revelation leads into this when it says no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast, right? The mark of the Antichrist. All this connects to the rest of the book of Revelation, man. I tell you, it's incredible. Next, there's a temple of Aphrodite was there, too. Aphrodite, Aphrodite is the deific mask of Ishtar to focus on the love goddess aspect alone of Ishtar, just the love goddess. This mask releases all manner of sexual depravity, releases pornography, transgenderism, the debasing of maleness, castration, exalts castrations, you know, sex change gender confusion in order to weaken societies and nations where men become weak no longer protectors and the women wear the combat boots in other words the mask of aphrodite mirrors the commands of kybele who has the same function who gives the same order to it in fact revelations chapter 2 verse 12 through 17 goes on speaking some more about this stuff and we're going to look at that in a minute so but before i go into the church of pergamum where it has all the same functions that i just mentioned here with some plus others 
folks, that is a deific mask. Do you understand that the deific mask of Aphrodite is to 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 weaken by the means of the love goddess, <laughs> pornography, transgenderism, the basing of maleness, the women wear the combat boots, okay? Do you see that happening in the world today by chance? Now, now let's jump into Revelations 2, 12 through 17 concerning the church of Pergamum. I'm just going to go through this quickly, folks. That Pergamum means a high place as in reflects hubris and pride. A high place of hubris and pride where a marriage covenant happens to be sealed. It was known as the place of Satan's throne. It was where Zeus's, a temple of Zeus was. Zeus was, is equated at that time with Satan. It was known as the place of Satan's throne, where his divine assembly of fallen angels would gather. So every deity you can imagine was there. All the false angels, all the demonic deities were there. Now listen to what Revelation 2, chapter 2, verse 12 and 13 says. And to the messenger of the church at Pergamum, right? These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not den deny my faith, even in the days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Look at what this means. Again, Jesus is taunting the entire assembly, their entire plan to seduce the church, to accept pagan occult practices into the church in order to keep the church from carrying out the gospel message, folks, or the, the works of the Lord he wants done on earth. In fact, Revelations 19.15 tells how Jesus will return to defeat every single one of them and the Antichrist by the sword that comes forth from his mouth. This is a direct taunt, folks. There's no other way to take it. He's reminding them that by the death of one faithful martyr, Antipas, that brought down his power way back then. And it will happen again, which is in direct context with Revelation 6, 9, and 10. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Do you get the picture? Revelations 2, chapter 18 and 19 talks about the church of Thyatira, folks. Let me just jump right on in here, folks. Man, I tell you, it's going to get hot and heavy in a minute. We just went through this not too long ago. The main patron god of the city was the fallen angel known as Apollo Trinemius. And again, Kybele, or Subali, and Artemis. Again, more deific mask. Triminium, or Trimineus, Trimineus is the human incarnate son of Zeus, who translates into being the Antichrist, with the Apollo attached to his, to his name by the hyphen Apollo there, with Apollo acting as a deific mask that's used as the empowering spirit behind what is needed to raise him from the abyss. How? By inspiring the wealthy guilds of Thyatira, which translate today into secret societies nowadays, to, to cause every single one of them to be united in will, desire, and belief for the purpose of pagan dominionism. And that means they control everything, all aspects of commerce and business and movies. They control everything. And when the Antichrist comes, they hand it over to him. You get it? And they rule as their governors. In other words, they hand it over to him and they become ruling satraps or governors to rule in alongside of him in different places of the world okay you also had the temples of Kybele and Artemis there releasing their deific mass to weaken the church by seducing through what I call the big Jezebel spirit to Christianize this pagan dom dominionism so that they hand off the world not to Jesus who they think is Jesus but to the Antichrist we have a rise of dominionism going on in some churches right they want to take it over and hand it over to jesus the same storyline as pagan dominionism how ironic 
if we only knew the Gibbons and what the people of that century, the first century, knew, because they lived it and had to deal with it, folks. Apollo is said to have brass feet, I got to tell you, in order to implement his new laws, and he had the eyes of fire that denotes releasing of plagues and vengeance against any that he so chooses, okay? That's People probably don't know that about Apollo, but you can look it up online. You'll find it. Well, Jesus is actually taunting him here in Revelations 2.18. And to the messenger of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has the eyes like flames of fire and his feet like fine brass. Jesus is strongly implying, not so fast, bucko, you ain't it. I am the I am because you were defeated by the cross. The gates of hell will not prevail here. Yes, some will fall, but others will not. Well, folks, let's look at Revelation 3.1 and the messenger of the church of Sardis, right? Let's look at the meaning of Sardis again. There, it means several different meanings. I'm applying all of them. It means the red fiery one or the red fiery stones. or I just call it the red fiery ones. Prince of Joy, Escaping. The main patron god of Sardis, at, wow, comes as no surprise again, is Kybele, or Subali. And I'll give you more on this one and now that I haven't been able to give you. Okay, let's look at Kybele, a.k.a. Ninhar, Sag, and Timiot. They all share the same profiles. They're called the birth mother of the gods, the lady of the mountains. They're the ones who nurture, trains, and equips. This, again, like I said before, matches Aedzel's job of corrupting humanity and the making of commerce and all the war industry and all manner of depravity, the divination, and all the stuff that, that talks about in the book of First Enoch, that Aedzel was banished into the rocky places of the abyss for. Okay? I gotta tell you, folks, in a ancient tablet that's entitled Secrets of the Great Gods. It says that Ishtar of Nineveh is Timiat, the Dark Mother. However, this is a deific mask for Timiat's thirst for power and the spilling of blood by the bucketfuls. It's not the same as Ishtar, but it is an avatar of Timiat called the Ishtar a Nineveh. I just want to throw that out there because this is this this gets pretty hot and heavy here. But again, Ninhursag, aka Kaibali, mantle of authority for doing all this, actually went to the real Ishtar in order to finish the job of corrupting humanity, because like Azel was sent to the abyss, folks. The, the chaos banker was sent to the abyss. I say this because Ishtar's profile symbol is Venus's eight-pointed star, and it has nothing to do with mountains or being a birth mother. Do you get how to do a profile by looking at certain attributes, and all of a sudden you'll be able to sort these out and see their deific mask and what the occult world is trying to conjure, maybe on you, maybe your family, maybe your church. This is where you find Subali's temple, or Kaibali's temple. And you will most likely find a temple that conjures one of Ishtar's deific masks. It's usually associated with one known as Artemis to conjure up the huntress aspect, a certain huntress aspect of Ishtar, okay? I'm going to back up here and tell you something. Both Subali or Kaibali and Artemis are said to have authority over seven vengeful spirits or evil spirits and the seven sage gods who instruct humanity. And if you cross the seven sage gods who are to instruct humanity on the on the earth, they're going to send seven vengeful, vengeful spirits against you, okay? The huntress, okay? Just get an idea of that. But in Revelation 3.1, we see Jesus taunting this. And to the angel, the messenger of the church in Sardis, right? These things says he, Jesus, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Do you see something cooking here? What Jesus is implying is, what do you have? I am the seven spirits of God, for I am the I am. And I have the seven messengers in my hand to my church, so your gates of hell will not prevail against it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? But some of my people... And Sardis have been seduced to be emasculated and made dead by you. 
and no longer know I'm coming. To them, I say, repent or else. I'm just paraphrasing for you to get an idea of, how, of some of this stuff. See, Subali or Kaibali's key deific mass concerns the holding of the power of life and death and seeks to install emperor king worship along with the assembly of elites to work alongside of to ensure the king can do whatever he wants to. Folks, I got to tell you, cultists use deific mask to unleash in the church today as it relates to Sardis is to emasculate that church and to bring death into the church. This involves sacrificing one's faith in God and the influence of his Holy Spirit for something else, deadness. In other words, it accepts gender flipping. It accepts the things God hates into the church. The Artemis mask, focus as the huntress of souls, is to finish the job of and deconstructing God's order in this type of church, and helps the Kybali mask to castrate the power of God out of this church by making men in, into pajama boy and the women into warrior princess, okay? In other words, it seeks to castrate the manness that's sent to protect families. So families are left fatherless and kids left driftless, and they justify it. The old order is dashed. There's no direction in life. It turns God's nature and order totally upside down, as they say, as above, so below, and as below, so above. Folks, what I'm pointing out is that places like the Burning Man ceremony that's recently occurred is all about releasing deific mask of the old fallen angels against the church and against those that oppose their their united focused wills and desires and belief to implement their brave new world. And folks, the Bohemian Grove is another conjuring point for this type of activity. So are local covens. Reports are coming out how some of Witkins are realizing now that they have released something that's not really good, something that they can't control, that they were promised they could control. And they can't control it, and they're getting worried about it. Okay? Well, folks, I got to sadly say this. This is where the YouTube version ends. And that's why you need to join the Daily Renegade, folks. And you can join the Daily Renegade to get the rest of this show and watch the unedited versions of this show, folks. Here, this I hate to do this to you. I know you're sitting on the on the end of your seat right now but this is why you need to join the daily renegade because we do not know how long we will be on social media like youtube or facebook before they access us okay again or ban us or give us a temporary ban whatever that's why it is important to join the daily renegade for ten dollars a month and a hundred dollars a year just click on the link below to do that i tell you folks you really need to <laughs> i tell you you really do because you know you can get all the great content here and if you do you can finish listening to this series i'm sorry folks i want to apologize for that but just the way it is folks we got to build up the daily renegade into a viable media platform we have to have alternative platforms in order to bring christian content and shows like this to you so you can learn from so please join for ten dollars a month and a hundred dollars a year just by clicking on the link below so with that you you all watching on youtube i have to say uh so long for now but for those of you who are listening on the daily renegade you get to hear everything so let's close that out so now folks let's look briefly at the deific mask that's used against the church of laodicea the patron deity was the fire Gian, zeus and the moon god nana along with cleophas apollo and the worship of emperors as gods these were all deific masks, and they were released in conjuring rites that lulled the church to sleep to mimic the Endymion story. Well, so let me, so folks, let me briefly tell you the Endymion story. 
You have the moon goddess, Selene, who was also a man, possibly Nana, who had the hots for a, a good-looking chap named Endymion, who was rich, who had wealth, and had, had, was in need of nothing. And he was so good-looking that this one wanted to have, but Selene wanted to have its way. So it talked to, to, to Zeus and said, Why don't you put Endymion into a cave, into this wretched cave, asleep and blind and naked with his eyes open, so this moon goddess could have its way with this great hunk of a guy, okay? And so they had 50 daughters from this. Not men, because they don't want men. They want to, to feminize. This is the divine feminine, feminine at work here. To feminize everything, okay? Just saying. If you know about the divine feminism and divine or the triple goddess worship, you know what I'm talking about. But that's the Endymion story, where one is put to sleep in a wretched state, naked, blind, with their eyes open, in a dreamland of wealth and in need of nothing. And many folks are in that state right now, united in will and desire and belief system of the occultists to compromise with the world, to be like the world, to grow church like the world. All this is done so the church pays no attention to the rise of the Antichrist, pays no attention to Bible prophecy, and no attention to the worldwide move to make people agree to common fairness as defined by the occultists. We see a push toward this social justice and tolerance. But they have a Bowie knife behind them that will slit your throat in a heartbeat if you disagree with their definition of tolerance. You know, go figure. This Antichrist is someone who's going to be raised from the abyss. And, and this Antichrist figure is called by occultist the last word or the Amen. He is called the faithful and true witness of the devil. He's called his son, who is the beginning of his recreation of the world into the devil's in image with the devil's throne above God's. Well, Jesus is actually mocking this in Revelation 3.14 when he says, And to the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things says the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the, the beginning are the author of creation of God, the author of the creation of God. What Jesus is saying here, he's that one. You ain't devil. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Jesus is saying, I am the amen. I am the faithful and true witness that came to earth, the witness, the power of God. Jesus said that whoever sees me has seen the Father, right? He is a faithful and true witness. Uh, he, book of Hebrews chapter 1 says that Jesus, he is the author of creation, which matches the beginning of the creation of God. He's the one who created everything. He's the one. He even created the devils. So you you guys ain't it. You're not going to raise this antichrist out, and you're not going to accomplish your task. But, however, the Laodicean church, some of the people in the Laodicean church are put to sleep like in Dimnion, folks. What does it take to wake those folks up? It doesn't take a small little rap on the door. It's a pound, pound, pounding on the door to wake them up out of their slumber and how blind they are in order for them to get their act together. Okay, do you understand that? He's pounding. He's pounding on the Laodicean church's door. Which church do you fit in the most? Laodicea? The compromising church, the one asleep seeking after wealth and prosperity and compromising with the world and so seeker sensitive you don't want to offend anybody. Are you like the church of Pergamum where anything goes and your cult goes in it and you call it the works of God? Are you like Sardis who have just been emasculated and you're dead to everything? Are you like the Ephesus nitpickers? Who do you belong to? Uh, if you're in the Smyrna church, you're, you know you know you are, and you will overcome because Jesus has a great promise for you. So who, what church do you belong to? Are you the Thyatiran bunch who wants to hand everything over to Jesus through dominionism? The Lord's knocking on the door, don't you think? Finally, folks, I'm going to just share on the Church of Philadelphia again, on the Philadelphian church that overcomes the deific mask and of its patron gods, Athena, Hermes, Hephaestus, Apollo, and Dionysius. 
And there's others there too, folks, because this was known as the Little Athens. These are all in sync to prepare people to think only one way and to cry out for a need of a world leader to arise. In other words, they, this world leader will be the Antichrist. Dionysius will intoxicate you with this. Just think for a minute. And Apollo will help bring this one out, out of the abyss. Hephaestus will supply the weapons needed against the church in order to carry this out. And you have Hermes, the messenger between the gods, in order for this to work. And you have the patron deity, Athena, the Philadelphian church, overcame. They overcame their use of libations, their blood rituals and body fluid rituals as keys to open doors and portals to release these deific masks against them and their church to bring it down. Again, Jesus is taunting this. Look at Revelations 3, 7, and I bet you didn't know this. If you don't know the givens, who the patron deities are, and their storylines, and how the occult world works here, but like these people who came out of it in the first century church did, you're going to miss a lot, folks. I tell you, folks, this is incredible stuff. This is totally incredible stuff. They use these rituals to open portals, open doors. Again, Jesus mocking this. Look at Revelation 3, 7. And to the messenger of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens, and no one shuts, and shuts, and no one opens. It is only Jesus who has the keys of hell and death. They do not. Only he is the key of David, who teaches his people how to come into the heavenly divine council chamber called your prayer closet and seek his counsel so you can go out and do war against these deities by and avoid getting all hot to trot and proud in the mind and all balloon-brained, thinking that you, you can declare and decree whatever you want. No, these, these people understood. they got to go before God, get their marching orders, come in to the heavenly realm, so to speak, come into to the heavenly court in your prayer closet, interceding for folks, talking to the Lord, getting your marching orders, how to tackle a problem, how to tackle this, how to save your family, so forth, etc., folks. And then you can go out to war against these deities. Bottom line, folks, is this is what covens are up to today. This is what the Burning Man celebration is all about. This is what the Bohemian Grove is about. This is what the Gotthard Tunnel symbolizes. This is what the rise in Luciferianism is all about. How it is releasing stuff into the church. It's how covens release stuff against the church. They do so by releasing these types of deific masks into the church to lead the church astray. The Philadelphian church people, types of people, defeated this sort of conjuring by having that band of brother love that I talked about before. The word phileo love, where Philadelphia comes from, the city of brotherly love, that is really defined that Brotherly love is really best defined as a band of brothers love where you're tight, you're made tight through like combat veterans have. You share common um, hardships and, and struggles and you go through things together and you have a band of brother love. I'm going to stick with you closer than a brother. I'll come after you. I'll defend you. They overcame with that type of love for each other. Where is it in the modern American church? Do you see the deific mask tearing the church apart like it says in the book of James where every evil work is? Through strife and division. Think about it. And the Philadelphian people types, or the remnant I call them, defeats this conjuring by having that band of brother type of love. They're fully united in their purpose, will, and faith in Jesus alone to defeat all the works of the enemy, and they overcame. Athena, who is the full manifestation of Ishtar, without a mask, the one known as the Whore of Babylon mentioned in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Think about it. They know the Lord and he knows them. They understood the power of what Ezekiel chapter 13 verses 18 and 23 say out of the ESV, folks. Listen again. I shared briefly on this, but I was all choked up when I gave that message with allergies 
and I had the sniffles and I was very congested. Not now, I'm getting over that, hallelujah. But Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 18, listen in to what it says. Thus says the Lord God, let me paraphrase out of the Hebrew, thus says Adonai Yahweh, woe to the women, or woe to the people who sew magic bands upon all their wrists and sleeves. In other words, they put people in their pocket and make veils, make the mask, make the deific mask for the, to cover the heads of the persons of every stature and the hunt for souls. Will you hunt down souls belonging to my people and keep your own souls alive? Sounds like a little taunting here by the Lord God, doesn't it? Yahweh. Veils are the same as deific mask. These act like avatar. They release the minions that are in the, de in the deity's army, spirits. They're like flies and mosquitoes that pester you, that are a cloud around you. You ever go into a room of a, where chaos is and you have a very depressed or, or crazy person there? You, there's a lot of stuff buzzing around, right? <laughs> I'm gonna just give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. And sometimes when you go into a place where a coven is at work inside of a church, a, those spirits will latch on to you and you take them home with you without even knowing it. And they start wrecking havoc in your family. And yet the church doesn't pay attention to this stuff. Wow. So these veils are the same as the deific mask. Their spirits sent like flies to pester you. <laughs> and they're conjured by people who are taken captive to do the devil's will. Isn't that even more ironic? Who will betray those people who are doing the conjuring and attack them with the same spirits? What those people don't even know. that what, And those people who conjure don't even know they're going to be attacked. And the most result is insanity. Just like Aleister Crowley happened to him and a few other notables. That's why they put the deific mask on, to keep their goals, to bring forth somebody out of the abyss. Do you get it? That the book of Revelation even talks about that. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. It's all in the Bible. Ezekiel 13, verse 19. You have profaned me from among people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, putting to death souls who should not die and keeping alive souls who should not live by your lying to my people who end up listening to the lies. Handfuls of barley and pieces of bread speak of the libation, pouring libations, blood rituals, body fluid ritual, spirit cooking, and sex magic. You know, you ever heard of fertility rites? These people were not dancing around naked around stalks of rye and, and, and wheat. They weren't using bread and stuff for that purpose, folks. <laughs> they weren't dancing around pieces of bread either. They were doing rituals, high order witchcraft that does what? Puts to death people, souls who should not die. You heard me right. God is speaking, not me on this. And keeping alive souls who should not live. You see these type of people avoid all manner of consequences and get away with stuff that normal people won't. And it's supernatural. Look at Hillary Clinton. What she got away with so far. Look at some of these other people. How do they get away with it? Why is John Podesta talking about spirit cooking? Handfuls of barley and bread for, you know, the high order sex magic is going on here. Folks, put two and two together. They keep alive souls who should not live. How? By wearing down God's people with no justice being done to these people. There's a constant drum beat. Boom, boom. Just like those old drums and those old rituals. Boom, boom, boom. Conjuring spirits, drum beat, and pressure of the wicked always getting away with it. Do you see any of that by chance? Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe you do. I don't know. But you always see the wicked get away with it, and it makes the heart of the people sad, doesn't it? It kind of, you start end up believing the lie. Oh, why, why even try? You see how conjuring works? See how these deific masks work to wear you down? How by lying to God's people end up listening to their lies, and they settle for becoming good Laodiceans, good Ephesus types, and Sardis types. They become really great Thyatiran 
Dominionist, and they're sold out Pergamosians. They all just enjoy playing games so very much because you get it. Ezekiel chapter 13 and 20. This is God speaking. Therefore thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I'm against your magic bands with, with which you hunt the souls like birds, and I will tear them from your arms, and I will let the souls whom you hunt go free, the souls like birds set free, okay? Listen, this is talking about the huntress aspect of Ishtar, called the huntress here. These people out there in the occult world at Burning Man and these other places and covens conjuring this stuff against you, people of God, wake up. Wake up to what God is saying. He says, and start quoting this. Why don't you quote God's word for a change? Therefore says the Lord Yahweh, the Lord God, I am against your magic bands with which you hunt souls like birds, and I will tear them off your arms, and I will let, let the souls whom you hunt like birds go free. That's what the Lord's saying here. God says what? I'm going to tear them from your arms. I'll let the souls whom you hunt go free. Amen. God is saying that. Do you have faith, brothers and sisters of God? Do you feel faith arising that God is speaking that over to you? And you can use these scriptures against the works of darkness and against those who think they're smarter than anybody else and they can get away with it. Why don't you do some spiritual warfare? Stop trying to take over the seven mountains of influence and be deluded by the dominionist stop hiding out in pergamum and bringing the occult in stop being like ephesus a bunch of nitpicking you know what well, why don't you stop being castrated and grow something grow some moxie become what you what god meant you to be come on folks god says what i'll tear them from your arms i'll let the souls go free whom you hunt like birds listen to verse 21 your veils those deific masks also I will tear off and deliver my people out of your hand, and they sh will they will be no more in your hand as prey, and you will know that I am the Lord. I am Yahweh who created you. Just what Jesus was saying in those uh, when he was taunting those deities. I am the Lord. You ain't getting away with it. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. There will be some who fall, because they they're not right in my eyes, but the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm coming back for church without spot or blemish. Look at verse 22. Your veils, the mask, I also will tear off and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall no more be in your hand as prey, and you shall know that I am the Lord God. Hallelujah. Why? Because... You occultists have disheartened the righteous falsely. Although I have not grieved him or made him depressed, you have encouraged the wicked that he should not turn from his evil way to save his life. That's why the Lord's going to tear the righteous out of your hands. Because you disheartened and you discouraged, you depressed the people of God falsely with your lies and god is very hacked off in the name of jesus he's very hacked off at you now if you don't believe me folks listen to verse 23 of ezekiel chapter 13 therefore you will no more see false visions nor practice divination i will deliver my people out of your hand and you will know that i am the lord God, can you folks say hallelujah and do a cartwheel over that? <laughs> can you folks? I'll tell you folks, I tell you, this is heavy duty stuff. I hope you enjoy tonight's message, but I just want to just go ahead and continue for a minute and just pray for you all for a second. Say, Heavenly Father, just come before you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I know the enemy is coming against us like a flood, and you raise up a standard against that flood, and you are that standard, for you, are, Lord, are our banner. As you said, Lord, Thus says the Lord God Almighty, I'm against the magic bands which you hunt souls like birds, and I'll tear them from the arms of the occultists. I'll let the souls whom you hunt go free. This, 
I will tear off your veils and masks, and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand as prey, and you shall know that I am the Lord God, and you have no power or authority in the name of Jesus over my people. You have wrongly accused my people. You have brought them into, de into depression. You have disheartened them. You have destroyed their lives falsely. And you end up encouraging the wicked to remain wicked and not repent. Therefore you will no more see visions, nor will you practice divination, says the Lord, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you will know that I am the Lord God. And that's what I ask you, Lord, to do for the people. I come before you and ask that you just set the people listening free of the occult world that's attacking them. And if they ever are attacked by it again and come in contact with it, they can pray this prayer and remind them just who you are because we are your child. We are a child of God. Let me rephrase that. I am a child of God and people who know you are a child of God. We are your people in Jesus' name. I thank you for defending us and protecting us and keeping us far from the evil one in jesus name amen so folks let me just go on just a little bit longer and say i will be getting a new series on the confessions of the afterlife i'm a near death or, or an after death survivor and it affected me profoundly and i want to talk about my after death experience and how it affected me in in my walk with the lord today and and, and, and stuff that i never get a chance to share on some details in the book that I wrote, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, that I wasn't, I, I, I just never seem to be able to actually teach on or share on, because you have time limits. Well, I don't have too many time limits here, I can make this a series. I want to show you what some people who have bona fide after death experience go through after they come back, and the struggles they go through as well. So why don't you just stay tuned for the next series on the Christian Marauder called confessions from the afterlife with that again folks please join up join the daily renegade for ten dollars a month and a hundred dollars a year and join right on up and get all the great content here just click on the link below with that i want to say god bless you all in jesus name and have a great wonderful day and don't let the occultists rain on your parade in jesus name amen